and we're back. Last episode, we talked about the European coal and steel community, the EEC, and how it almost fell apart. Today, we're going to talk about the decades leading up to the founding of the EU. So far, there were three institutions, the EEC, the coal and steel community, and the European atomic community. They were three different organizations with basically the same goal, unite Europe. But all three acted independently from one another, and it was time to merge them into one. So in 1967, the merger treaty was signed, which, as you might have guessed, merged the three institutions into one. This treaty set out three goals for the next 25 years. Expand to other countries, create a fund that would help develop poorer regions, and make it easy for products, people, services, and money to travel between the countries. And so the European Communities was founded to achieve these goals. Seeing the economic benefits, more countries wanted to join. They were Spain, Norway, Denmark, Ireland, and the UK. The last four had actually tried joining a couple of years ago, but the goal, ever afraid the UK and USA would try to dominate the European communities, vetoed their ascension. While the French had elected a new president, so they tried applying for membership a second time, Spain was refused on the basis that it was a dictatorship. The other four countries held a referendum where the citizens could vote on whether to join the European communities or not. The Norwegians voted against, and the other three countries voted in favor. And so six countries became nine. Greece joined later in 1981, which I'm sure isn't going to cause any problems in the future. Greenland became independent in 1985, held a referendum and left the European communities as it didn't agree with the fishing regulations. Spain and Portugal overthrew their democracies and were now allowed to join the European communities as democracies in 1986, bringing the number to a grand total of 12 members. In 1975, the European Regional Development Fund was created. Its purpose was to transfer money from rich regions, not countries, to poor regions to improve infrastructure, attract investment and create jobs. This type of activity currently accounts for over a third of EU spending. I'll leave this map here if you want to pause the video to take a closer look. Funny thing, one of the reasons the UK voted to leave the EU in 2016 was because they did not want to spend their money on poorer regions in Eastern and Central Europe. Well, do you know who the biggest supporter was of this fund? The UK. They went so far to make it a major issue when they joined the European communities, pressuring the rest to create this fund. Why? Because at the time the UK had many of the poorest regions in Western Europe and they received large sums of money to build up their economy. There's some irony for you. And in case you're thinking that this takes away prosperity from rich countries, it doesn't. When the poor become richer, they have more money to spend and if they have more money to spend, they will buy more stuff. Which means that rich people become richer as they now have more customers. It also means that these previously poor people are now able to produce new goods and services. It is thanks to this fund that Estonia is able to develop Skype. It's why Poland has become rich enough to create the Witches series. It's why the UK grew prosperous enough to create create the Harry Potter series. It is thanks to this fund that a stagnant economy like Spain grew to become the fifth largest economy in Europe, behind Germany, the UK, France and Italy. Or to put it in another way, Spain's economy is just as large as that of the giant of Russia, thanks to these funds. And then came the last goal of the European communities, free movement. Over the years, the European countries have made some progress towards this. European citizens no longer needed visas anymore to cross borders. You just showed your passport, got a stamp and moved on. So if for example, you as a Portuguese citizen woke up in the morning decided you wanted to visit Paris, you could hop on a plane and be in Paris that evening without first going through the lengthy and expensive process of getting a visa. And in 1985, this idea was expanded with the Schengen Agreement. Agreement, one of the most iconic agreements of Europe. With this treaty, anyone can travel between the member states without first being checked at the border. With this treaty, you can walk all the way from Portugal to Denmark without once being stopped to show your passport. With this treaty, countries save large sums of money as they no longer have to pay for expensive border checkpoints. Think about how radically different this is from let's say the USA and its war with Mexico, Israel and its war with Palestine, the Soviet Union and its wall with Western Europe. This, the idea that people can live, work and study anywhere they want within Europe. That you, as a tourist, can at this very moment backpack to 26 countries with 26 different cultures, languages and peoples. That any of these countries can benefit from the knowledge, know-how and experience of any of the other countries without unnecessary bureaucracy. This is at the core of Europe. An open continent united in diversity. And now that people could move freely, it was 
was time that goods could as well. This had been an economic boost to the Benelux. While yes, you no longer had to pay import taxes for your goods for decades, as discussed in the last episode, every country still had different legislations concerning these goods. A product sold to Denmark would need to adhere to different standards than let's say Ireland. This means that if you sold to several countries in Europe, you would need to look into each country's specific laws concerning your product, then make a different version of that product for each country. This drove up the cost of products and made it less appealing for companies to do business in Europe. This wasn't a big problem for the large economies such as West Germany or France, but companies might not be so eager to sell to small countries like Luxembourg or the poorer countries such as Portugal. This could no longer be. In 1986, the Single European Act was launched. This was a vast six-year program that would sort out the differences in national regulations of each of the member states by harmonizing their laws. It gave the European institutions the power to combine the economic laws of European countries so it's easier for companies to do business in Europe, meaning more jobs and more stuff for its citizens. At the end of this program, the European communities had achieved its goal. A larger European community, development funds and free movement. The European communities lived up to its purpose and with a new Europe came a new name. The European Union. If you liked this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe, as I will be making 4 more videos about the European Union, and afterwards I will be making videos about other interesting topics. And let me know what you think about the European Union in the comments below. This video was made in collaboration with My Country Europe. If you want to show your support for Europe, head over to their page by clicking here and see what they are doing.